good evening, dear ladies, dear gentlemen. Welcome again. We saw many of you three weeks ago. We really are appreciate that you take time for tonight's Zoom conference. We had the last time the topic women's role and women's contribution in peace building and conflict resolution. We want to continue on this way. Today's topic is women in conflict zones. We are very grateful that we have amazing speakers from Lebanon, from Cyprus. This is two countries that are conflict ridden since decades. And also, but also we really appreciate all of you who came and registered through the registrations. Uh, I could see that you, many of you are leaders of organizations, part of initiatives, active persons. So we really appreciate it. We really hope we can inspire, empower, encourage each other as we meet together with our men and friends and colleagues. Thank you very much for coming in. My name is Renate Amesbauer. I am the Women Federation President in Austria, the Austrian branch. We are an international NGO covering the whole world with about 100 to 140 countries uh, registered, Women Federation as organizations. I will be the MC in the beginning, and then I have a young colleague, Ms. Lale Ashrafi. She will take over after the first speaker. And then again, I will come in at the end, which brings me to a very practical viewpoint. We, have, uh, we will be able to have a question and answer session at the end after our uh, amazing speakers. So please, if you have questions, write them in the chat box. We will pick up those questions and we, we should have 20 minutes, 25 minutes to answer those questions. So now I would like to start with our first speaker, who is Mrs. Caroline Hanshin Mosa. Caroline is born in America, but luckily enough, her husband is from Switzerland. So for more than 20 years, she is in Europe. She is inspiring, encouraging, empowering us with her lively spirit, together with her family. She is the Director of Women Federation UN offices, of all the offices international. She is in Geneva, the co chair of CSW, which is the Committee on Status of Women. So, in the women courses, women topics, she is very active. And she is active in Human Rights Council because this is based in Geneva. Also, she is encouraging young people to join in and to become active. So she founded the Women Federation internship programs 2005 so that young people can become creative under the umbrella of Women Federation, which is very amazing and beautiful. Her topics are education and peace. So dear Mrs. Caroline Hanshin, you have the floor. Unmute. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Renate. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to the Women's Federation Austria and Middle East for organizing this timely event, and of course to our speakers. I was asked to say a few words about Women's Federation in the context of today's topic. Almost 30 years ago, 1,600 Japanese Women's Federation members left behind their homes and families to travel around the world to 160 nations with the sole purpose to invest in the lives of complete strangers beginning by listening to local women. Each team of 10 created their own itinerary plans and projects according to indigenous needs with the motivation to serve and support local women, to strengthen their communities and their families, to teach skills, build confidence, and create networks of solidarity and trust all around the world. Some went into nations where there was war, and some even lost their lives. All have left an indelible mark in those nations and in remarkable advances in the strength of their character because of the quality of their sacrifice and service. This was a visionary initiative of Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, 
the founder of the Women's Federation for World Peace, and her husband. I can only say little in three minutes, but from this bottom up, inside out approach, inside meaning peace begins from me, um, to peace building and development, Women's Federation has discovered important evidence. Women's intuition, commitment to peace and development, local knowledge, skills, passion, uh, preference to work for prevention or for reconciliation, and in consensus are all calculable and astonishing steps in sustainable peace building and community transformation. Currently, while these programs are ever expanding and evolving, another team among us is advocating for the real life results of these thousands of programs at the United Nations and many national and local institutions through consultations, debates, publications, and partnerships. Many of our educational and service programs are aligned with the UN SDGs, and as Renata said, various human rights articles and peace consultations. Young men and women are participating and rerouting their lives, expecting more of themselves. In closing, I just want to mention a very recent focus of our work. Last Friday, we prepared the speakers for and facilitated a webinar with over 600 participants for the International Association of First Ladies for Peace. The theme was women's leadership in times of crisis. With five current or former first ladies speaking on the panel, speaking on the panel, Women's Federation was invited by the Universal Peace Federation to help develop this new association based upon our years of serving women and youth in most of, our, of these nations. We spoke together last Friday so seriously and realistically about solutions to conflict, violence, pandemics, poverty, youth disengagement, and I was asked to be the session facilitator. I had the feeling with, that we were talking about these seemingly un, insurmountable vast issues with these prominent women like we were holding a family intervention. They spoke frankly and freely and with such concern and love for the people of their nations. So as we go forward to develop this network of leading women, together with responsible civil society, we are discovering that we are tapping into a new resource and partnership that holds so much possibility for exchange, for change, hopefully too in the area of conflict prevention. Today, too, all our speakers are experts and great women who live what they speak. I hope we can learn many things together today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kavali. Now, Lala, you, please. Mm -hmm. So, uh, am I on yet? Yeah. Hi, and good evening to everybody. Without any introduction, I'm going to introduce our uh, first um, speaker. Ms. Svetlana Biovic. Uh, uh, she is actually team leader of the SW Civil Affairs uh, United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon. She has extensive experience working in war thorn countries for international organizations and UN under the Peace and Security Agenda. And since 2018, she's been involved in a project by UN Women and uh, UNFL, United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon, contributing to peace building in Lebanon and to implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security. Ms. Uh, Jovic, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you for introduction and thank you for inviting me for this uh, panel today. And uh, I really feel privileged to have an opportunity to talk about our work in Lebanon. Before I talk about our project, I wish to say a couple of words uh, about UNICEF. So if we can start with my presentation. Just to explain to you UNICEF work in the south of Lebanon for your better understanding of the context we are doing our project. So, UNIFIL was established in 1978 for three purposes, confirming withdrawal of Israel forces, restoring international peace and security, and assisting government of Lebanon in ensuring return of authority in the South. Next 
please. In 2008, after the July War, UNICEL mandate was extended to cessation of hostilities, which now includes op also operational support to Lebanese army to return to the south and liaison coordination with parties in conflict. Next, please. Very clearly, UDFIL has a security uh, mandate, which means under peace and security, mostly military is involved in implementation of our mandate. Our mission is headed by force commander, who is at the same time a head of mission. Our presence is uh, uh, la large uh, in a military way. We have 10,000 troops. Next, please. And these troops come from 44 countries. These are the list of troop contributing countries. Next, please. Our daily mission, just to have a gist of idea, idea how much we operate on the military side, is we have around 450 operational activities per day. We are the only mission that has maritime task force, and we have helicopters and uh, versus 10,000 military, we have only 800 for the civilians in total in the mission. Next, please. I'm working in UNIFIL Civil Affairs Office, which is an office, small, um, 20 people altogether. We are responsible so for the sub substantive part of the mission, which means we act as a primary interlocutors between the mission and population. We actually talk to people and authorities on behalf of the mission. Next, please. Our job is uh, to establish contact with the with, uh, uh, community, with uh, Mukhtars, mayors, uh, civil society, women, youth, etc., all with the aim to build confidence of the host community where we are uh, in our mandate, in our work, and to work on conflict prevention and conflict resolution. Next. Uh, working with women and assisting Lebanese authority in ensuring um, effective participation and involvement of women in decision-making process is also part of our mandate. We do that um, through uh, empowering economically women, building their capacities, developing skills to uh, easier access job markets, or by organizing um, training for elected women municipal officials, to know, uh, to improve their knowledge on local development of municipal legislation and communication skills in order to be better representative of their communities. But we also do first aid training, uh, self-defense, we organize uh, handicrafts markets and events. We reach out to women employed in different sectors, is it education, social services, health, but also Lebanese armed forces and security institutions, all with the aim to establish relationship and better understand their needs and concern. Before, next, before I start talking about our project, um, I would like you to see a video about uh, our workshop on conflict resolution and mediation. Since 2017, UN Women and a number of other UN agencies, uh, including UNIFIL, supported the government of Lebanon to develop uh, the country's first national action plan on UN Security Council Resolution 1325. The resolution is important to ensure that women participate in decision-making processes in the country on conflict prevention, in political processes, and public life. The trainings that we're doing with UNIFIL is to really begin engaging women at the local level in acquiring these mediation skills in order for them to really resolve whatever disputes, whatever conflicts they have at the, at the local level. الوجه اليوم هي وجه من عدة سيدات من الجنوب سيدات جنوبيات اللي هن ممكن يكون لهم تأثير بمجتمع الجنوبي ويكون وسيط لحل النزاعات بين الأسرة بين المجتمع ويكون بنفس الوقت هن بمجال المشا اللي دع المرأة في المشاركة في القرار بالقرار السياسي بالقرار الاجتماعي بالقرار في مجتمعه وبمحيط فيه. 
نحن اشتركنا بهالمشروع مع هيئة الأمم المتحدة للمرأة صار في تعاون مشترك لتنفيذ هذا المشروع ودعمه خصوصا أنه كمان بيكمل استراتيجيات المرأة اللبنانية نحن عم نشتغل مع بلديات من المنطقة ومع نساء موجودين هون وهن بيشتغلوا لأهل المنطقة ولبلدهم للبنان This is a workshop where 28 women participated in the training. The training is still ongoing. Uh, this is a two years program now under UN Women. Uh, UNICEF launched and financed the first three months of the training um, uh, and with our objective to build capacity of women and their skills in order to effectively vo voice out their opinions and influence decision makers uh, and to take active role in their communities. Challenges while implementing this program were many, you know, uh, this is a two years program and I think preparation for this uh, was uh, approximately one year. Um, it took us a tailoring and adjusting uh, uh, the whole process uh, for the local needs. The traditional settings and conservative mindset which women hinders women access to decision making was the first obstacle we faced with. Also ensuring participa regular participation of women was also uh, a challenge. Best practice civil affairs has used is was a uh, used and still is using uh, related to engaging communities, engaging all aspects of, of and uh, all, all community leaders. Is it mayors, muktars, um, uh, school directors, influential family members, mostly male citizens in order to support implementation of it. Tailoring program to the needs on substantive side is only one was only one side and obstacle. We also had to adjust to the content of women living. Usually this program is done at the university, so students, the women come or people come, attend at university, go back home. Here we brought university to the south and this was done first time in actually history of our work in Lebanon. We brought teachers and trainers to the south, to the villages of the women, so they had easy access to attend. We have been uh, hosted by mayors in their municipalities in conference room. Uh, husbands who brought women participated in the workshops were walking down. Mayor was very often knocking doors and without knocking doors, entering to try to hear what's going on, what we are doing with his women. Anyway, all that gave uh, um, uh, interesting setting, I think, to academia when they had to face all this uh, non very academic way of, of treating the lectures. At the same time, the benefits were excellent. We managed to buy local ownership, we, we engaged the local community, uh, we have uh, proven that we are doing something for the community benefit and and that was really appreciated so uh, many uh, um, many papers are written of importance of women in evolving in conflict resolution but unfortunately in practice we are lagging behind we have very few uh, cases and i'm so very proud to to share with you this this uh, project and uh, to to show that in practice we manage if we really believe and if we really put all the energy we we, we manage to involve women in um, practice that's all from my side uh, thank you Ms. Kiovi presentation so uh, we are moving to the next speaker, which is Ms. Hermine Shevan. I hope she's here. And uh, she's a member of the National Board of WFWP Germany since the early 90s. And her main activity has been the outreach to the diplomatic field and the organization of conferences under the theme Foundations of Peace. She moved to Lebanon together with her family in 1997. 
and she's been involved in peace building and humanitarian projects as an international delegate of the uh, Women's Federation for World Peace. Ms. Yellen, the floor is yours. Hello. <laughs> Good evening. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, we very good. We hear you. Yes. Very happy to be part of this webinar. Thank you so much for inviting me, the Women's Federation from Austria and Middle East. Uh, so actually, uh, my focus of this presentation will be mostly the humanitarian aid programs that we did in Lebanon for the last years. Okay, so uh, if we can, uh, so anyway, it was after the Syrian war broke out uh, that uh, so many refugees came to Lebanon and they were living, many of them living in a very difficult situation. It was like incredible when I went to visit the camps, I couldn't believe, you know, what situation they were facing. It was horrible to see that. And so we felt we really need to do something. So, and we initiated, since 2014, <clears throat> we initiated humanitarian projects. So, and starting with, uh, so we had uh, several sponsors. Uh, the first one was actually UPF International that gave us the funding. So in order for us to give donation to the family. So they were really happy to have the donation. They tapped them really, uh, not just physically, also morally. It was very uplifting for them. So we did this like for a period of eight months that we gave them on a monthly basis to, to the families. We gave cash donation. And, uh, sorry, I have to see the screen. Yeah, so anyway, uh, also we, in the beginning, that was also in that period of, that we thought we really need to also support uh, the schools who have many refugees. And here you can see uh, this picture, this was actually, when we met the principal in the Kettle Meyer, South Lebanon, in South Lebanon, Ketamaya town, we visited a public school there. And then the principal showed us the school and we saw this one room and she said, that is supposed to be a library. And it was completely empty, totally desolate. But she says they really would like to have a library. And then thanks to the Women's Federation, International Women's Federation, great support, we were able to completely furnish this library in Ketamaya. So they were very happy. That was really a, a wonderful thing that we could do for that public school that has a very big number of Syrian refugees go there to this school as well. So next, please. So you can see here, so <laughs> children gather together in the library. So it was really very good to see that, how happy they were that they could have it last the library. Next, please. Yeah, so here, uh, all around it, uh, I don't have all the pictures, but just selected three pictures for you to see. So we have bookshelves all around it. On both sides, uh, we have big shelves. Uh, also in the middle, there are bookshelves. So it's, it's really, we are very happy we could do that for the Katamaya Public School. That was very good. Thanks to the International Women's Federation contribution, we were able to do that. Okay, uh, next please. So now uh, I'm, uh, I would like to introduce to you the other programs that we did, uh, humanitarian aid projects we did. So. Actually, we felt that it is not just enough to, to have uh, give things to the refugees, uh, the, you know, basic things that they need, but also we felt they need to have care and attention to morally uplift them. So this is why we connected, we connected a very big university, very uh, well-known university in Lebanon, LAU Biblos. We, 
we communicated with them and we uh, introduced to them our program and said that we would like to collaborate to bring in students to the refugee camp and we had really agreed on that common our common ground was to really work together to create a special moment for the refugees in order to give them hope for the future because sometimes when the situation is so difficult and overwhelming so they feel i have no hope there is no hope for me you know but that moment that we created really helped the refugees a lot and so this was really amazing this poster here that you see was actually uh, created by the university and uh, displayed at the campus. They, they spread it out everywhere in the campus. As a result, we had over 100 students from the university volunteering to go to the refugee camp and really reach out to the refugees, especially the children. Next, please. So here's also just briefly, you, you can see, uh, how the students were really reaching out to the children. So it was just so amazing to see that, how they spent time with them, playing games with them and interacting with them it was really precious. Next, please. Then uh, here you see, this is like, a, we usually combined that we had like uh, the, events that we did in the refugee camp are usually some family festivals or connected UN international days and uh, also the university was also giving donations yes they gave also food donations that students were collecting so this is like one example that we received this food donation from the university actually but the other great sponsor was for this family festival. We really appreciated support from Germany. IRFF Germany gave many times donations that we were able to really give a lot of food donations for the refugees and also create uh, barbecues and other kinds of things that we did, you know, buffets and things like that we were doing at the time. Next, please. Yeah, so, okay, we can just continue. Next slide. So this is another example. You see how, uh, actually, here in this picture, we, I have to say that also we had international volunteers. These ladies are all coming from Sweden. So they were also joining our volunteer program and humanitarian aid program. So it was wonderful to have them with us. Yeah, so we was like, as you see, the refugees are very happy to see the young people always. That was really very much uplifting for them morally. Okay, next please. So, I mean, I put this picture so that you can just see how we were able, thanks God, put smiles on their face, you know, because that was not the usual thing that you see when you come to the refugee camp. You don't see them really smiling, but in this moment, thanks God, we were able to really uh, make them happy, you know, that you can see that actually. Next, please. So, this one uh, slide is showing that we had also one of the programs that we also did was providing medical care for the refugees. We had uh, a medical team come there on a regular base and uh, doing free consultations and things like that for the refugee family. So that was also very helpful that we could do that. So that was uh, another project that we were doing. Okay, next please. So this is uh, another occasion. Uh, this was always under the theme of family festivals where we had uh, given them, you know, this kind of uh, delicious foods. We were having banquets, uh, like uh, buffets, things like that for them, next to entertainment program or giving them pampers and milk, things like that also. 
So yeah, so these pictures again are just giving some examples of, of this kind of festivals that we did. Okay, we can go further. So that one is actually, uh, sometimes we did a barbecue for them and they really loved it, we did a barbecue. So we got usually sheep, sheep from the butcher, nearby butcher, we got sheep and then, uh, you know, they were, the men were helping to cut the meat and we could create very nice barbecue for them. So that was also a very special treat for them. So all of this together we were able to do really was very good. Okay, uh, next one. Yeah, we can continue. Just move on. So this one here is another uh, project that was actually uh, thanks to UAE Embassy. I must really say when we met the ambassador and we in the UAE ambassador and we introduced to him our project that we do in the refugee camp. The ambassador was very impressed and he said they, they would like to collaborate with us. So they only work with NGOs they trust and they don't work directly with refugees. So it's, it's through the NGOs. So, and when they put us on the list, I must say I was really impressed of how generous they were. They gave us a lot of donations, you know. For all the families, they gave huge boxes filled with a lot of food items. In the winter, they gave, they gave us clothes for the children, clothes and blankets and also pampers and milk and all these things. So I. I was really moved by the generosity of the UAE embassy, what they contributed. It was very, very valuable, their contribution. Okay, next please. Okay, so this is um, just one picture uh, to show to you actually what we also did was education program in the first year when we started the humanitarian aid program. Actually, many children from the refugee camp, they were not able to go to school. They were not enrolled yet. They, they were not, there was some, some obstacle for them. I don't remember exactly what what the problem was, but we found out that many of the children in the camp were not going to school at all. So for that reason, we start to really establish a, a school program inside the refugee camp. And so thanks to the funding that we received from Korea, from the Tongil company, we received big donation. And we established like created two tents, school tents, you know, furnished them with tables and chairs and we hired teachers as well so that we could pay them on a monthly basis. We hired the teachers and uh, so through that we, we were able for a couple of years, we could do an, a special school program, educational program for the children. That was also very, very good. We were able to do this. Yeah, so anyway, uh, basically, if you would see uh, the refugee camp, I don't know uh, if you are familiar with refugee camps, but when you see the situation, how they live, under what circumstances, yeah? So first thing you think, oh my God, this is so overwhelming, you know? It's like, how can I help them? What can I do? But really, my conclusion is that we should always strive always try to give and do what what we can. We should just give what we can. And, and that itself is really a very noble thing to do, to really reach out to our fellow human beings in, in the miserable situation, that we really uh, have the empathy for them. So anyway, uh, this is just a, a brief summary of of the activities that we did in the, the humanitarian aid programs that we did in the refugee camp. And uh, of course there are many, many other things, but uh, 
I'm really glad we were able to do these things for the family. So, and we were able to create precious moments for them that really gave them new, new hope for the future, and especially for the children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Shannon, for your presentation and also for your contribution to WFWP. And let's go to our uh, next dear speaker, Professor Maria Haji Pablo. Uh, she's been an associate professor at the Department of Social and Political Science, University of Cyprus from 95 to 2013. And she's a feminist and conflict resolution scholar practitioner. And she also founded among other organizations, the bi-communal uh, women's NGO hands across the divide and the gender um, advisory team. As a gender and conflict resolution trainer, she also worked for UNFPA and trained women. Uh, Professor Haji Pablo, the floor is yours. Thank you. You can hear me? Yeah. Okay, yes, good evening, please. everybody. And uh, I'm so happy to be in conversation with uh, wonderful and remarkable women this evening. I want to thank the Women's Federation Austria and the Middle East, especially Renate and Zoe for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> as was mentioned, I come from uh, a conflict resolution background and also political science and feminist studies. Um, so in my work at the practitioner's level, I use a lot of the theories from conflict resolution and uh, two or three of the basic concepts are very important for me are complexity, uh, a web of relationship build, uh, building, and also transformation. Um, by complexity, which I, uh, I will apply to Cyprus. Uh, next, please. Next slide. Uh, in the Cyprus context, we see the complexity of it being uh, demonstrated at the local, regional, and international level, where there are different stakeholders. Every time there was um, uh, a conflict or an intervention in, uh, on the island. Um, the other thing is that there is a web of relationships among the different stakeholders, Greece, Cyprus, Britain, uh, and Turkey and also the regional context, and of course the international, especially during the Cold War. So in the 60s and 70s, uh, we had to reckon with this. Uh, next slide, please. So what is my argument in this presentation is that as in many other conflict or ethno-national conflicts, we've, we see that the problem dominates the everyday discourses, the media, the political parties, and so on. And many important uh, issues like women's rights, uh, health, environment issues, violence against women, uh, migration, sex discrimination, and so on are often very marginalized. So what do we see in these kind of societies that the patriarchal order, as I call it, is uh, often becomes mediated with nationalist and masculinist politics, but also with militarism. And these forces decide which of the uh, agendas and discourses will be visible and which will not be uh, talked about or marginalized. So in Cyprus, the predominance to this day of the male authority um, has really brought about an omission of democracy and very often exclusion. Uh, next, please. So in 1960, Cyprus became independent. So just four or five of the most defining um, uh, dates in the recent history of Cyprus. So 1960, the Republic of Cyprus was uh, uh, an inter-ethnic bicommunal republic with power sharing model. However, 63, we had the break, the first break of violence and the first creation of 
the green line, especially in the Nicosia area, the capital. And from 64 to this day, we've had the UN peacekeeping force on the island. 1974, we had a coup uh, engineered by the Greek junta in Greece and also local officers. And that gave the opportunity and the also uh, recourse to the Cyprus constitution to the Turkish intervention. And since then, you see the island is being divided into two parts, the northern part and the southern part. It's the first time in uh, the history of the island that it's been geographically de facto divided ethnically. In 83, unilateral declaration of the northern part into the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, which only Turkey um, uh, recognizes to this day. 2003, we had the opening, as you see, of the various checkpoints to this day along the Green Line, the Demarcation Line, the Attila Line, the Ceasefire Line. There are seven different designations about this line, which shows also the complexity. Uh, so a lot of movement to and fro. And uh, one of the women's Hands Across the Divide NGO, one of our may, uh, early goals was our, to fight for our right to communicate face to face. So in 2003 was for us a very big opportunity to start developing um, relationships across the divide, building uh, trust and confidence building and so on. 2004, we had a referendum. Unfortunately, the Greek Cypriots voted against the Anand plan for a solution to the Cyprus problem and the Turkish Cypriots for it. So this meant that the division will continue. Talks began um, and continued until 2017. However, to this day, we don't have a solution. So the island continues to be divided. So here you see some of the symbols uh, and all these um, seven different flags which show also how nationalism is being portrayed in symbols and militarism with the two British bases still on the island. And now of course the EU flag. Next. So we live uh, we, under which conditions do we work? You know, in rapprochement and also with, uh, women's groups in a culture of conflict of us and them. So the, there are two competing narratives and these competing narratives, the one tried to convince the other of its own victimhood and also of its justness and its uh, own rights. So there is an exclusionary uh, view of the other. So polarization and enemy images, we see them also functioning in many of the uh, education uh, textbooks. Um, however, and the other thing that is very often um, an issue in ethno-national conflict in terms of uh, gender is how pain and suffering are feminized issues. And as if men do not suffer and do not have grievances and are not vulnerable and are not traumatized. So within this context, resistances. So we've had a uh, bicommunal rapprochement work since the early 90s to this day. I don't have the time to go over this. Next, please. So here you see how the state instrumentalizes women's pain and so on with the relatives, the mothers and sisters uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the missing persons. Next. Okay, now here I mentioned some of the main, of course there are many more uh, women's and also uh, by communal today peace groups and, and so on. However, uh, Hands Across the Divide is the uh, first independent by communal women's NGO, which has um, done and developed a lot of uh, programs to this day. 
and the other one is the gender advisory team, uh, and of course, FEMA in the Turkish Cypriot community. Next. Here are, um, you know, some of the street demonstrations. This is uh, the Turkish Cypriot demonstrating for peace and also for the negotiations to restart. And this was before the checkpoint opens. So the Turkish Cypriot women demonstrated in the north, next, and the Greek Cypriot uh, women in, in the south, next. One of our projects uh, as Hans across the divide, the previous one, just one second. Um, can you show the previous one, please? Yes, here, uh, one of our projects was a peace bus, which was to go to former mixed communities, you know, and get the people together. Of course, we were able to do this after 2003, when the when we could uh, easily go to both sides. Next. Okay, gender advisory team. We started our work in 2009 and one of uh, our uh, main points was how to integrate the gender perspective in the negotiations. So we worked a lot with the, the various um, uh, tools and instruments of the UN, <clears throat> the EU and so on. And of course, one of them was or the, gen the 1325 um, resolution. Uh, next, please, because I'm uh, <laughs> aware of time. And here you see the, internet, the Security Council male dominated body. For the first time, they came to recognize the gender aspect of conflict, peace, and security. And this has been a very big, I think, landmark in the efforts of uh, women um, uh, activists and peace builders. So the four pillars, participation, protection, prevention, relief and recovery are also very relevant to our work in Cyprus. Next, please. <clears throat> So how did uh, the gender advisory team work? We built a strategy where at the same time, we worked at three different levels, the macro, the meso, and the micro level. And we find that uh, these are all in uh, dialogue. They are not separate. They all exist in a conflict system and in a system of peace building as well. So we uh, worked at the macro level as a gender advisory team after we developed our recommendations on all the issues that are at the negotiating table, governance, citizenship, economy, and also um, education and property, which is a very, very um, sensitive issue in Cyprus. We worked with the decision makers, mainly the negotiators and their advisors to both communities, uh, presenting our work and getting their feedback. Then we worked at the MESO level, which is the international organizations, diplomatic communities in Cyprus, the media, and also other uh, international organizations. And the micro level, which is the um, societal level and notably and notable individuals who were influential. Uh, so the work in a way that got produced went through all these levels in conversation. Next. So some of the achievements was that the negotiators uh, had appointed a gender focal point in their work, which was not there before. The other thing is that we opened up a public discussion for the participation of women in negotiations and peace building. And also the uh, other one that was very important was the establishment by the two leaders of a technical committee on gender equality and some of us are members, which is functioning to this day. Next. Of course, the other legitimacy that uh, this work um, received was from uh, 
the Secretary General, and this here I have an, an example of Ban Ki-moon's reference to the gender advisory team's work and civil society, and that the negotiators should take uh, this work into um, consideration uh, when uh, the talks are uh, going on. And uh, finally, the representation of women at the negotiating table is still one of our challenges. There are no women at the negotiating table after so many decades of uh, peace talks in Cyprus. Next. And uh, here I have a, <clears throat> because of time, I don't have the time to read it, but it's uh, an extract from my book where I really promote women's agency and women's voices that need to really come to the forefront and to um, impress that not only the ethnic aspect of the problem is important, but so many other divisions uh, related to the conflict uh, are important and intersectionality should be also uh, taken into account together with um, multiple voices from the civil society. Next. Here are some examples here. Is we had an, um, an activity where we present 1325, that Turkish Cypriot women, that Greek Cypriot women, scholars and others. Next. And here is from a regional conference we had from women from the Middle East and from the Balkans on 1325, are uh, developing networks and also sharing experiences. Next. Here is with the diplomatic community uh, and uh, with the uh, UN um, office of, uh, in Cyprus. Next one. Two more. Yes, here is uh, the Secretary General's representative in Cyprus, and he met with us uh, quite often to uh, brief him on our work and on our uh, also suggestions. Next. And here is the technical committee when we were invited in The Hague. And um, that's uh, where also our new, um, in a way, strategy is how the technical committee and um, its work should be promoted uh, at the negotiating table. Thank you. I think that was more. Thank you so much, Professor Haji Pablo, for your informative presentation. Thank you. Uh, so we are moving to the next speaker, which comes from a bit more um, different background, which is academia, and that's our dear professor, Dr. Irine Etzetsdorfer. Yes. Uh, she is political scientist and contemporary historian at University of Vienna Institute of Political Science and guest professor at the University of Krems, visiting professor at Harvard University, Franklin and Marshall College, Lancaster, and University of Napoca, University of Graz, and Innsbruck, uh, with academic um, specialization in political theory, history of ideas, and international relations. Dr. Edstorfer also has uh, several publications and remarkable books. Uh, dear professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, marhaba, masa el uh, I'd like to share a few thoughts with you since I'm not a practitioner. Uh, well, I was wondering, I mean, conflict zones is a very general term. And uh, do we limit it to armed conflicts or do we understand it in a broader sense as a zone where for various reasons, Leading a good life is impossible due to strong societal tensions and the dysfunctional state. The latter would apply to a wide array of regions. So generally stated, conflict zones are created by either by rough states 
or in states, uh, so by actors, different actors, sub-state actors, state actors, uh, in with troubled societies. And uh, both terms uh, were forged by the American philosopher John Rawls. So rough states are aggressive and dangerous. They do not respect human rights. Uh, they do not include all segments of society. So there is no consulting uh, hierarchy in the political process. So, uh, but women can be there when they are from their, their own elite groups. So conflict zones uh, in troubled societies uh, uh, which are not expansionistic, but they lack mainly the human capital, the know-how, and sometimes also the necessary material and technological resources to be well organized, which finds its expression in corruption as the leading societal and political principle, hand in hand with more or less despotic governments. Uh, in both of them, uh, so rough states and troubled societies, the principles of freedom, equality and justice, among them, of course, the equality of uh, women and men, uh, cannot dwell. And yes, these are modern political principles, Western in their origin, but they were overtaken by, by the international community, more and more so in their global agendas. So in both of these societies, it's hard to find out the popular free will of people uh, because of autocratic governments, but also, and this is uh, among many reasons, but I'd like to emphasize this, because of the incapability uh, also of illiterate people to even recognize their rights, the inability to articulate them, combined with uh, the social pressure to stick to cruel social or religious traditions or by mere force. But uh, the traditions uh, are regarded as uh, their own traditions. Uh, and sometimes uh, this gets into tough tensions uh, with uh, the Western political principles. So, now, it has been agreed by the international community that uh, it is a duty of well-organized societies to support troubled societies, uh, but support is not understood in a material way only because some of them think of rentier states are not poor at all. And in very exceptional cases, the international community even has a responsibility to protect the basic human rights uh, of the civilian population through a military humanitarian intervention. This is then the very, the very last mean. Um, so uh, where can women in those societies be reached? Uh, they can mainly be reached in development programs or in a refugee situation. Uh, and I would like to focus on the latter a bit. And uh, Lebanon will come into the picture as well. As refugees, they are protected by international law, but they may still live in a conflict zone, be it that refugee camps are militarized or the host state is weak itself and doesn't have the capacity or the will to properly care for the refugees and humanitarian organizations. Um, but sometimes under the international umbrella, women enjoy more rights uh, than they enjoyed and they have ever enjoyed at home. But my point here is the following. I will try to get the screen. Um, so, uh, the international community has recognized that providing refugee protection and humanitarian assistance is a moral imperative but international law requires that assistance to refugees is to be carried out in a non-political, civilian and strictly humanitarian manner. Underlying is the international order based on nation states and their main pillar, internal and external sovereignty. In the beginning even, hosting refugees was uh, discussed as a possible inadmissible criticism of another state. So when you receive them and host them. 
And refugees are pictured as civilians. They are perceived as non-participants to an armed conflict, and it is assumed, this is where the strictly humanitarian idea comes from, uh, that they act in an entirely civilian way. So in short, uh, humanitarians and humanitarian assistance, whatever they do, must not come under the spell of acting in a political manner. And humanitarians are very well aware of this. And I think um, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of examples were given what you do as a humanitarian. So, but what does it mean today? Uh, since armed conflict have transformed quite a bit and all this idea, the Geneva Conventions and the... So, what, I, what was I saying? Um, what does it mean today since conflicts have transformed and all this idea uh, stem from thinking the interwar, uh, the interstate war and not uh, the, in, the internal wars, so kind of uh, uh, civil wars. So the situation we face today is different, but uh, the refugee law more or less uh, stays the same when it comes to the non-political manner. So uh, women in a refugee situation where basic security uh, is given and basic needs, very basic needs are fulfilled. Their continuation of the previously led life is interrupted and required a sudden change. Things are in turmoil. The family is often separated. Those with qualification are in a resettlement program in another country. And those who are not in demand in other countries have to stay in refugee settings, which acquire adaptations to new situations. This is a very confusing situation, which could actually also be a starting point for a transformation of these women. Um, so uh, my main point here is how could such an enforced rupture of a traditional life, uh, which is also, well, which also contributes to the causes of conflict, be turned into a transformation process for women to be more enabled? Because when we talk about these women here, I will, I will come to this example, then it's mainly about enabling them. Uh, not only to understand their rights, but also to receive more skills for standing their own grounds in their future own society. Uh, not to be um, misunderstood. Um, so I have everywhere seen offers for alphabetization courses, trainings, uh, even Sumba, Samba courses in the Jordanian camp of uh, Saatari. But when it comes to discussing their own deplorable situation in their own society, the source of all conflict, humanitarians have to act very cautiously due to the ruling principle of non-political uh, assistance. Not only cautiously, they fear these situations. So this is the example I would like to give to you because sometimes we also will do some field work. So this was in September in the... Okay, can you see it? Can you see and hear? Yeah. 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 Okay. So this was in, in September 2019 in the Beka Valley in Lebanon. A group of students, myself, had the opportunity to talk to Syrian refugee women in a health clinic, which is also supported by the Austrian Hilfswerk. All organizations there do an admirable job, provide health service and alphabetization courses. Um, the refugee women we spoke to were all of age between 15 and 70, mainly from rural areas with no formal education. All were well nourished, properly dressed, as you can see, and all had access to fresh water. I've seen water tanks behind every tent. So given their dreadful situation, uh, uh, they were not in need of basic supplies. Sometimes, uh, well, one of their sons was in the Syrian army, another one with a rebel group, possibly fighting each other. In our conversation, these women concentrated on complaints about the shortage of money provided by the humanitarian organizations, uh, which is true because it was cut in 2018. 
Some had husbands who worked in construction or agriculture and did this also before they had to flee. Some lived also before the war in Syria half of the year, I, um, before the war in Syria half of the year in Lebanon. When I cautiously approached the questions whether they would be willing to work for money themselves in such an emergency situation, uh, for example, help in shops, clean households, help with the harvest, they categorically refused and the Lebanese social worker who did most of uh, the translation said, oh, uh, this question uh, I have to carefully reformulate, but I fully understand what you mean. The answer was no way, no, we would never do this. Uh, this is against our culture, our husbands would never allow it. All we want is to be united with our families, preferably in Germany or Canada, um, in case that one of their children uh, could make it there. Um, also rebuilding their own country was not an op uh, appealing uh, option. They would, they would rather stay in... Uh, uh, so, uh, when we tried to discuss with them why they would like to go to a society uh, they are completely estranged from, uh, a society they do not understand because uh, the affluence uh, yeah, in our societies is based on both sexes generating wealth, on principles of equality which come along with, with uh, duties and rights, and uh, why such a living would be desirable in their fantasy, uh, only because it promises material well-being or because they would actually value uh, also a free society. Um, so actually we got the answer that they, they would like to live the same religious uh, life they have previously lived, but still uh, take part, yes, they would value, um, well, uh, the rule of law, of course, but they, 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 would not, uh, they would not change. Okay, let's say this is in the realm of uh, fantasies. Um, but for me, this was uh, an amazing, uh, these were amazing statements. I hope I could make my, my point here. So um, example two, I skip. Uh, example two uh, was example Two here was a bit, yeah, maybe, maybe I say a few words about example two. This was in the, in the UNHCR headquarters uh, in Tripoli, a tough moment. Uh, we are in the middle of a briefing by an American lady who was in Iraq during the armed conflict, so very courageous and devoted. She explained to us that one of the first things she tells the refugees is that they have to adjust to the reality that they will most probably never live the way they did before, maybe never live in a big family united when some of their relatives made it uh, in resettlement programs uh, to Canada, Germany, other countries. Uh, they made it because of their qualifications, uh, but uh, they have to adjust to the fact that uh, yeah, living the big families uh, will, not pos will not be possible in the future. She also told us that she doesn't feel supported in her attempts um, because she is a humanitarian and she is not entitled uh, to talk politics uh, with the refugees. So all she can do is uh, raise some aware awareness um, and uh, actually her job is to administer the refugees uh, but uh, not qualitative work. While we were speaking, a protest group who heard that the Western delegation was visiting tried to block our way and rigorously demanded to be put on a list for a resettlement program. So this was almost violent. We had to leave the compound through a back door. Example three was the promising one. Uh, the Red Crescent headquarters in Amman. They also take care of Syrian refugees, uh, of women. They also act under humanitarian rules, non-political, strictly humanitarian. Also, Jordan never ratified uh, the Geneva Conventions, uh, as uh, Lubnan uh, never did. The Red Crescent uh, also offers language courses, but in addition, they offer also training courses uh, for professional skills. 
not to forget, there are many young widows with children among the women and they will have to contribute to support themselves and their children after they return or also when they stay on in Jordan. So what kind of professional skills did the Red Crescent offer? Sewing, coiffure, uh, handcraft and assistant nursing. This was actually their priority, mainly for the family and maybe later as an assistant nurse. Women did participate and these were mainly younger women, but with respect to their culture and in order not to get into any troubles, so we criticized those fundings, the skills taught were the traditional women's roles. Women as caregivers and not professions where they could fully earn good salary later, like, I don't know, carpenter, hotel cook, gardener, etc. Um, so it's clear that uh, you cannot offer courses for being a teacher because you need other requirements uh, and prerequisites. Uh, so the point here is, uh, please do not misunderstand me, I really value what, uh, what is done there, but they socialize the women into the traditional women's roles. So um, uh, to sum up, uh, refugees have political rights under international law, but uh, in uh, Lebanon and in uh, Jordan, uh, it's a bit more complex because on the one hand, they are under the umbrella uh, of the UNHCR, but not all of them, uh, uh, but uh, they are not, strictly speaking, not under the, the universal version of the Geneva Conventions from uh, 67, because both countries never ratified uh, the Geneva uh, the, the refugee convention. So, but uh, the question is, uh, in how far should refugee law be changed to somehow um, lower a bit the strict uh, non-political manner, which stems from the old interwar uh, idea of uh, interwar period where you do not criticize the other state because every state has a right to, to, to wage war. So, Actually, maybe uh, the approach by Amatia Sen and uh, Martha Nussbaum could help a bit, the so-called capability approach. First of all, uh, it's not about the liberal canon of, uh, of rights because when women are not even aware of their rights and what they can do with the liberal canon, with their rights, uh, the, the, the rights the liberal canon provides, uh, they will not embark on this train. So first, those women enabled. So in a way, they actually need a bit more than others uh, to understand uh, the benefits of, uh, of their rights, the benefits of, um, uh, of a profession. Why is it worth the effort? And uh, what can you do with it? So this is the question for our discussion and this is the, the image. Uh, in, in the English language, you have two terms, equality and equity. In German language, we only have one, for example. So yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Etzerstorfer. Um, it's really interesting and necessary to look at this topic from different angle, which is academic angle. Thank you so much. And let's go to the ne next speaker. Probably many of you know her already, and that's Dr. Zoe Bennett, director of WFWP with her background in psychology and oriental languages in France. She joined WFWP right at the beginning in 1992 and shared the Middle East branch. Uh, she also um, saw there in a way to support women in this country. It has always been her desire and passion to uplift and empower human beings of all cultures through service and education. Dr. Zoe Bennett, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. This, uh, all these uh, presentations were really so interesting, so amazingly uh, li lively and really very, very informative. Uh, of course, to live in peace is the main uh, desire of all people. But then uh, for most, it can be like a distant dream. And from uh, everyone's presentations, though, we can see that women can tackle the, the, the issue of peace and 
they can take peace in a more serious way and more practical towards making peace, towards building peace. And we saw that women have the capacity to invent and dare and advance the, into peace building. So um, uh, it is uh, in the last presentation we had, uh, there was said that uh, the um, peace is a way of life. In reality, if this way is disrupted by conflict and families are separated, people are hurt and um, friends disappear, obviously how can a, a peaceful life exist? Yet uh, with women, they, uh, they can react and they can present a very important point, which is resilience. I'm really very grateful to all the presentations because uh, this is to my feeling from what I was listening, uh, what has come out, the resilience and the, the thinking of all the different NGOs, all the different activities, how can we overcome the situation of non-peace towards reaching, uh, reaching peace? So um, women can aim to excel themselves and become a women of character. Then they come together, they plan, they implement their ideas and advocate. And then they can come and build peace. So if their plan fails, I, I believe women don't give up and they will continue, they will persevere. So a very important um, uh, characteristic would be uh, this point of resilience into um, realizing a, a, a world of peace. So um, we saw also very importantly that the UN is supporting uh, the, the efforts of women, the efforts to go beyond um, uh, um, conflict. In Lebanon, of course, we saw how much, how many efforts are being done. And I know in Cyprus as well, uh, the cooperation that uh, UN has given to uh, the gender advisory uh, uh, team and to other uh, very, very sincere efforts like uh, Dr. Hadzi Pablo has explained, the UN has been behind. And I think every NGO would need to reach a, a, an effort to become advisors to the, to the United Nations. Because the United Nations also, they need the input of the grassroots and of the, of the NGOs, which are the micro level, like uh, Dr. Hatsi Pavlis explained. Actually, I liked very much this um, separation and this classification of uh, macro media and um, uh, macro, meso, and micro level. And we see that women are necessary and they can act in all these levels is very important. So um, also another very important uh, field that we saw uh, is being um, used is also the humanitarian work. And uh, very importantly, Mrs. Ezehofer um, showed us so much how even humanitarian work has its own challenges. We all want to do good. We all want to, um, to be humanitarian and to give uh, help to, to different situations, but then how this can be done, there is a way. And that is why also uh, there's a lot of um, uh, efforts and understanding to be made for any particular situation in each country. Um, for many of you, as you know, the um, WWP in uh, the Middle East, uh, our organization in the Middle East is organizing uh, a, a yearly conference for, uh, where um, women from the region of the Middle East are invited, uh, women that are aware of the need of a peace building, aware and sensitive to the fact that a peace building is possible, but at the same time, although it seems as an impossible uh, dream, has to, to find a plan and find a way to be uh, implemented. So uh, this kind of women, they come together every year until now, 
they have been coming together every year, uh, bringing together their ideas, their uh, experiences, and trying to plan for uh, further um, uh, ideas, more togetherness, and uh, take back some, some points that ca they can use for their, um, uh, for their own countries. So uh, I think it, is, it was a very, very uh, educational and very uh, interesting uh, discussions that uh, presentations that we had. Um, last time we had this conference, this, uh, this um, webinar, uh, we talked about uh, taking on a regular uh, presentation, a regular every month, I think uh, Caroline suggested to hold a monthly uh, meeting where we would talk about um, different issues of women and peace. And I really, personally, I hope this can be taken on and this can happen because uh, it is very important, not only for the region I represent, the Middle East, but also for all parts of the world. And uh, especially for this area of Europe, which has been a very conflicting area, not many, just a hundred years ago, it was a, an area of lots of conflicts, uh, but it reached peace, or more or less peace. So peace is possible also for the, the Middle East, I, I believe very strongly. Thank you, that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bennett, for your uh, motivating words. Thank you so much. So I just want to thank all uh, great speakers for their time and their amazing inputs and insights and uh, thank you again for your contribution to peace building processes and just uh, pass the floor to our dear Renate for q a section thank you all again dear Renate the floor is yeah, thank you very much Lale I think I did not introduce you in the beginning but you somehow introduced yourself through the talking, she, um, Lale Ashrafi is our intern in Women, of Women's Federation in Vienna since a few months, so we are very happy to have her. Uh, I also want to say thank you very much to all the speakers. Uh, now we really have a little bit of problem with the time because the topics you, you touch are so extensive and your, your um, uh, talking talks are very impressive and very informative. So also it was not a failure that you talked a little longer than we maybe predicted. So maybe I want to put the questions uh, to each one of you who came through the, that came through the chat, but also that to take the chance to make a closing that you use the answering the question is also can be your closing somehow of the of the evening as we don't, don't want to keep people for two hours. It, is, it would be too much. Um, we got a question to uh, Svetlana, Mrs. Uh, Jovic in Lebanon from Caroline. Uh, how can we better partner as NGO with the UN? How can we better support uh, UN work as being an NGO? And I think maybe this applies for uh, all the for many of us, other of the other groups present through some of the ladies. Um, maybe we do it one by one. Svetlana, what would you like to say? Okay, uh, yes. Uh, let me briefly um, answer the question. A UN has started to build partnership with civil society NGOs. UN is a huge organization with the different agendas and different mandates. So if I talk about the peacekeepers, uh, and peacekeeping missions, they are tasked to develop a partnership with the local NGOs, with civil society. And in order to do that, they are looking for those who are officially recognized, meaning they are registered, they are having the status of association, they are neutral, they have a certain expertise, and um, they will, the cooperation with these NGOs will not aggravate the situation in a conflict zone. Actually, they have to be non-political, uh, 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 non-sectarian, no religious, etc., etc. So this is the one type of NGOs UN is looking to partner. 
In Lebanon, we are looking for local NGOs that uh, have this kind of profile, which means we do not work with those affiliated with any political party, any religious group, etc. because in Lebanon, this is too complicated. We don't even partner with NGOs that are outside of our area of corporations, because even this would create uh, uh, animosity between the groups. Why do you speak to North if we are in the South? For NGOs, so this is one group of, 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 of a partnership that uh, NGOs can develop uh, with uh, UN on the local level, meaning if they're in their local areas, like in Cyprus uh, is an example, and I saw in Maria's presentations, uh, as, uh, SRSG, Lisa, was on one of your yes. events, on your pictures. So there, our UN representatives will happily engage with those who are leading different processes. For example, women and gender. We're very happy to involve uh, with the local civil society, women association, if they are on their agenda have, for example, national action plan for women or want to be part of that process or they have expertise or, or uh, uh, a willingness to support certain gender related issues. But you can also have, you have, uh, uh, NGOs should not forget, they have development programs, they are humanitarian programs, they are human rights programs. So each NGO that has expertise in the field area, they have to identify UN agencies that are compatible with their field. So for example, if you have experts in labor law and, and lawyers or any kind of social workers that are very good in labor law, uh, international labor organization in Beirut is, or anywhere in the world, is the right organization to approach and to present the program. Because uh, developing partnership means from the grassroots level to us, from the grassroots to the central level. We have to develop a partnership to better understand what are the local needs, what are the local problems, but we shall not, uh, let's say, uh, um, go into the partnership in those who we call mercenaries. And uh, mercenaries are those NGOs who are looking for money so they can work. Agriculture, from agriculture, they jump to women's rights. From women's rights, they are all of a sudden mm -hmm. professionals in, in um, uh, uh, whatever, labor law or human rights. No. So, so we are choosing a profiled NGOs with a, with, a, with a profile that, that gives confidence to us, that will not compromise us in the society, on the grassroots, on the local level and central level. So th this would be my, uh, my, my answer to your question. Thank you very much, Svetlana. Very, very good answer. Yeah, we can understand very well. We can understand. Thank you. Oh, uh, we have a question to uh, Hermine. Hermine, there is interest to exchange, to help you with books for the library. Maybe you can shortly introduce um, how we, how some, if someone wants to help you, what can they do? What well, kind of uh, yes. Uh, so the, if it comes to the subject of books, we we already discussed with the principal about it, and. Uh, it is actually the principal from the school that would give us clearly the idea what sort of books they are best uh, needed, you know, what they will need for the children. So mm -hmm. not just any books, but really, so okay, we could, yeah. if somebody would like to donate books, we would uh, create a list together with the principal of the school. Okay? Yeah. So we okay. would say what kind of books would be best suitable for the children, and also what language is preferable, you know, of course, mostly it's Arabic or French, of course, in Lebanon, right? Mm -hmm. but, but so all these details we would need to find out first, because uh, you know, giving books should be really uh, targeted, not just okay. any book, yeah. right? Yeah. It has to be targeted. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Much. I, I think if someone is interested in helping with books, they can write an email to me and I can make the connection with you, Hermine. 
Yes, because that's good. That's good. Yeah, 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 right. From yeah, the yeah, that's true. registrations, and so and getting the link so they can get back to us and we connect yes. you and you can directly confer. Uh, yeah, with each other. Renate, yeah, you... right. Very good, Renate. That is uh, that is the best way to do it. Really, they yeah. they should connect you, and then we will. Uh, uh, yeah. See what Follow is yeah. Yeah. Can I add something yes. there? Please, Please. yes. Uh, precisely, this is one example of what um, uh, Professor Ezerhofer was saying. We cannot just give anything anywhere. Uh, those books, yeah. it has to be very uh, carefully chosen to fit yeah. to the context of the, um, of, of the Lebanese uh, um, education. If it goes outside, it is very sensitive. Uh, yeah. this, is, uh, this is a proof of what um, she was saying. Yeah. And it's the same everywhere. It's the same. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you very much. This is, I think, very good to know. Yeah, that you're not any books that we use here can be of use in your in this place. Yeah. Thank you. So, so we move on to Mrs. Hadi Pablo, Professor Hadi Pablo. There was a question uh, about the enthusiasm that you put in your work. How do you see the future of your work, and also? Do you have young people who take up this enthusiasm that you have all your life that could continue or help you, support you? Yes, I think uh, how to, it's very, um, well, my whole life, over 40 years now, I've been engaged in this work because I don't see any other way of solving conflicts other than really becoming engaged, becoming also committed to the bigger issue of gender equality, of really uh, uh, having a consciousness that uh, is uh, guiding us for a better world. And in my teaching, I've had uh, many, many students who really, you know, uh, followed uh, this work. I'm very proud of them. And some of them established the um, Home for Cooperation in the buffer zone that brings together all the communities of Cyprus in collaboration and joint work, etc. And the other thing is what's the alternative to sit back, you know, and see the status quo becoming more and more, um, you know, uh, rooted in something that has to do with separation instead of cooperation, collaboration and coexistence on our small island. So yes, I will continue this work as much as possible. And I wish that the decision makers took into account the voices of women, mm -hmm. of young people and uh, of civil society at large. Because if we are going to have an agreement in Cyprus, we need all these constituencies to believe in that agreement. And they will only believe when their needs and their voices have been taken into account at the negotiating table. Thank you very much, Mrs. Adi Pablos. Thank you very much. So then we have a, uh, we have a question to Mrs. Etzestorfer, because in you and your speech, actually you touched on so many points and it's amazing how how difficult it can become to help. So uh, one point I would, I would be really interested, how do you define equality and equity? How do you explain, would you explain those, these, these words? Well, I used the two terms uh, which exist in the English language, uh, but not in the German and not in others. Um, to differentiate uh, or to explain the capability approach of uh, Martha Nussbaum, uh, an American uh, philosopher who actually w worked together with Amatia uh, Sen for a longer time in this capability approach. The capability approach is mm -hmm. actually can be included to the debate, uh, the human rights debate. Uh, Nussbaum criticizes roles, the, the guy I started with, uh, not because she's against his liberal canon, but she thinks that the liberal canon 
doesn't help uh, when actually you are not enabled to yet to know what you do with all your rights or the school bus uh, which brings you to school but when you do not put a value to education then the school bus uh, is not of big help first of all you have to be enabled to actually see the alternatives. Uh, I mean, this is also a debate, a, a scholarly debate. Uh, the, the classic uh, economists, uh, starting with the individual, they always assume that, well, you make a choice between alternatives. But yes, but <laughs> what if you don't know your alternatives yet? Uh, so the idea is that some people, Nussbaum was called, uh, an Aristotelian uh, social democrat um, because she, she took her terms, the good life, etc., from Aristotle. Uh, and, uh, but of course, uh, I mean, she brought it to this world. And, um, but uh, her idea is that actually it also applies to handicapped people. Some of us need more. So they need a higher chair to stand on. This was the image. Uh, to be in the same position as others who are taller in this image. So this was the idea that actually, uh, and my example was that these women um, in the Pekka Valley uh, who only wish to be united with their families uh, and nothing else uh, in a country uh, whose culture they do not really like um, uh, for, for the benefit of some, I don't know, material benefits they imagine, but actually not to be an active member of uh, these societies. But maybe not because of dislike, because first of all, they do not even understand our societies, because uh, yeah, they do not understand their own society. And my argument was that the humanitarian, and when you are under the refugee <laughs> umbrella, actually uh, the political, yeah, this, the, the idea was why can't they have a moratorium, a transformation process while, while uh, um, in this refugee situation because their, their life is anyway in shambles. And uh, so this could be a starting point. It doesn't, yeah, it sounds a bit cruel, but uh, it could be a, a starting point to assemble it in, in a new way. Yeah, but uh, the, the hands are bound uh, because the humanitarians uh, actually uh, are very controlled not to discuss politics. Mm. Mm -hmm. Politics in a wider sense. I, I, I don't mean uh, party politics, uh, but politics in a, in, a wide, in, in a wider sense, including questioning uh, your own societies. I mean, for us, this is normal. Yeah, reflection, reflection, reflection. This is uh, the enlightenment we have in our bloods, meanwhile. Um, yeah, and this is what, what brings change uh, to the Western societies because we are in a permanent uh, transformation. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah th thank you very much. I think this brings, uh, we're coming together with cultures in a way, the desperation of refugees and people having to leave their country, it brings about a situation where we uh, begin. We meet each other. Maybe yeah, but, but it's more than that. I mean, yeah. these uh, troubled societies create yeah. the conflict. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. they are not based on uh, on uh, on, on freedom, equality, and justice. Yeah. So they they yeah. themselves create the conflict. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much, Dr. Etzestorfer. I would you. very much like to ask uh, also Mrs. Our uh, Mrs. Caroline Hanshin. Maybe she can explain a little bit what we are planning with young ladies, and then a last word from Sue Bennett. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, we have been discussing, I think it came up last time at the meeting with, uh, organized by the UN office in Vienna, um, about the idea of do making an event like this every month with the sort of rotating themes, which in fact, we would be happy to include your ideas for themes. Yeah. But maybe top on the list, also in discussion with Lale and uh, an assistant I have in Geneva, a young Indian woman, 
um, we thought we would start by start with um, asking our some of our youth to actually lead us in the development of a next event in did we did we set a date i don't i don't know if we july lale what did we say do you remember uh, yeah, you're, you. you're muted huh uh, we actually set the time for 17th of July. July 17th. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, there will be information, there'll be an invitation sent around. So it's not final, final, but it's sort of semi final, huh? Right, right. So right. I don't know if you want to say something about that or it's not our. Mm -hmm. Well, I can shortly explain about it that we already um, formed like a mandate. We're, we're gonna uh, call it as youth initiative of WFWP and the focus of young ladies in uh, peace building processes and culture of peace actually. And we want to make a bit um, stronger connection to academic uh, background. That means we, we make more research to the topic and all the, uh, the young ladies around the world and their activities in this case. But um, but of course, we're going to present the mandate, all the articles and everything, functions, structure, and uh, we'll keep you updated. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Lale. So, uh, dear Sue, because we have been the partners, you have been the partners, strong partner in this conference. What is your last word? Your your. A bit of um, empfehlung. What is this in English? Recommendation. <laughs> Recommendation. Yeah. Recommendation. Well, I'm really very grateful to uh, uh, our partners, the Austrian uh, WFWP and also the, the, the Vienna UN, who uh, really organized, we organized together this, uh, this event. And uh, again, I hope we can uh, do it again. And I hope all the themes can be uh, attractive enough and useful enough for a substantial uh, advancement of uh, a, a good life for all people, basically. This is what we need on earth, don't we? Thank you very much, Sue. Thanks, Dr. Bennett. So now we really, I really would like to conclude because the time has moved on. But I really want to say it is amazing, the amazing work that all of you are doing. And there have been many mailings in the chat to say congratulations to all the work that is done. We from the Women Federation in Vienna certainly want to wish that you can continue your find the power to move on and encourage those ladies and that ladies, we are not the, we are also half of the population to do things. We are the creators of the society as much as we are part of the society. And of course, we always have to carry the effects of everything that happens, but we can become the, the change of the future, every one of us. And I know that in the audience, there is many, many people who are doing amazing things. So I think there is enough, there's actually more than enough um, Stuff to continue this this program with peace uh, talks of the Women Federation to introduce other projects because maybe this is what we hope we can learn from each other we can inspire all of each other. Sometimes one lady one time said in Vienna even to think of someone is like a prayer a prayer of of power a prayer of encouragement. The more we know of each other, the more I think the changes can happen slowly but surely. We thank all of you for your patience. We also thank the listeners and those who might have, would like to come up with more questions, but the time does not allow for these. We will have the recording again, thanks to Lily and Tony Cook. Special thanks also to Tony and Lily who dealt with the technique. And you will have to receive the recording soon. We also make a written recording. If you send in some more of your information in written version, we can use it because we have informed many government people, we have informed embassies and people were asking, please do we have a report afterwards? So of course we will. We will, contribute, we will distribute to the list of the people registered for this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. And maybe we Thank can you. unmute and give a big applause. We should give a big applause to all the ladies who have been preparing so well.
Thank you very, very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 It's midnight in your country. Well, it's the morning. Morning, one o'clock in the morning. Oh, <laughs> I'm in Singapore. Thank you, Zoe. To rest. Thank you. Have a nice day. And make it a good And everyone, encourage.